All right, we got a Halloween episode of Inappropriate Earl. Uh, it'll probably be released Monday, but it's being taped on Halloween. Uh, we've had a lot of chicks on the show lately, Mandy and Andy, uh, Melissa Archer, uh, Leah Knauer. Uh, we, it's time we bring uh, back a dude into the fold, and this guy probably is the uh, only guy to have a, a .org website. Uh <laughs> You know when uh, you can't get a dot com or you're you're late late to the party. Uh, but he is a uh, very funny comic. Uh, he's also a door guy at the comedy store, uh, and and you think, wow, that this guy must not be very funny. Let me tell you who've been door guys at the comedy store: uh, Jim Carrey, Mark Maron, um, you know, many many famous comics that you've heard of: Steve Renazzisi, uh, you know. Many uh, comics that you see on TV all started working the door at the comedy store. Uh, Adam Devine was a never a door guy at the comedy store, but he was a door guy at the improv working the... Uh, he wasn't even a door guy. He worked the uh, box office. And I used to see people shit on him all the time. And now he's like the number one guy on the scene. Workaholics and whatnot. So always be nice to people you see working the door at the store or the improv or the laugh factory because the odds are in two years they'll be better off than you are so uh please put your grubby smelly sausage like finger hands together for the one the only the wild man the former wild man steven randolph what's up guys yeah i mean i once uh, had steven on the tom green live show where uh I was the co-host, and uh, Stephen was probably the most interesting guest uh, that me, Tom, or anyone else has had on the show. Oh, thanks, dude. Well, you've lived a wild life. I mean, uh, we're going to get into it, but you've uh, you've really lived nine lives. i pushed the limits. Yeah, literally, because you are a uh, recovering... Uh, What's the right word? Heroin addict. Well, I guess that's the right word. Cocaine, I mean, alcohol, weed. You did it all. Is there any drug you didn't do? Uh, I never smoked crack out of a crack pipe. Um, I've smoked it in with mixed with pot. Can I turn off the TV? Is it is it distracting you? I love television so much, and I, I can't. I'm like a moth to the flame. I'll just stare at it. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. I had the hockey game on. The Kings just uh, defeated Nashville uh, four to three. And uh, overtime at Staples Center on a goal by uh, Jeff Carter after uh, Drew Doughty uh, broke up three on one. And, of course, this news will be four days old. But, uh, you know, we, we, we stretch the limits here at the Skakel Report. And uh, Kings have won, now won seven in a row after dropping their first three. So all is well in L.A. land. I live in West Hollywood, of course, so we're gearing up for the... Uh, it's not necessarily the gay parade, but it, it essentially boils down to that. Uh, Halloween, it's, uh, if you're familiar with LA, it's from Doheny to say La Cienega, it's a half a million. You had to walk me into your driveway. They wouldn't even let me pull up. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, West Hollywood's total lockdown. Uh, it's, it's literally a half million people in uh, about a mile radius. You can't move. You got guys with their dicks out, uh, you know, concerts going on. I think last year was Joan Jett. Um, would you say that this would probably be the highest concentration of AIDS per square mile in the planet? I would say today it is. Yeah. I mean, you've got uh, probably 100 new cases will form tonight. Uh, yeah. And I'm being serious. No, uh, no, totally. I mean, my dog Lois uh, recently just shit on a guy's AIDS plaque. Uh, <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. And, That's and, disrespectful. Well, it's weird. She looked up at me like she knew she... <laughs> She was wrong, Jeez. and I'm like, it's probably how he got here in the first place. <laughs> oh, man. Lois, so don't worry about it. Shitting on a guy's AIDS plaque is pretty... That's just like the ultimate disrespect. Yeah, that's like a total diss. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and it was right outside the AIDS testing van, the the picture, the one with the big picture Blair Underwood on it. Yeah, it's like, oh, hey, what's up, dude? You got AIDS, so uh, yeah. go ahead and get out of the van. So, uh, by the way, a quick shout out to, uh, I don't think he listens to the show, but Dustin Ibarra, uh, great comic and actor, his series The Player with Wesley Snipes was uh, canceled yesterday, but uh, I thought he was good on it, so uh, Wesley Snipes, not, not the draw I used to be. Mm. The show was a little uh, discombobulated, you know, did you watch it? No. 
It's called a player, and it was basically a, a gambler's bet on whether the criminals would get caught or not. And, uh, you know, apparently they didn't uh, bet on if the series would go past five episodes. I mean, so. did Wesley Snipes, I mean, it's just that's just, you know. It's the business. Like, Even people like him are struggling. Yeah. Do you think he, he has money saved, right? Uh, apparently he, he does because he didn't pay any taxes for like seven years. <laughs> so, I hate paying taxes. That's the crazy thing about this business. Wesley Snipes, big movie star, TV series gets canceled four episodes in. You got. Well, uh, I remember something you said, and it was a guy that I didn't even. I remembered him from my childhood, but it was he was an, uh, a comedy store comic who died, I would say, a couple months ago, and he was on the marquee, on the backside of the marquee. And then I was replacing him with Michael Q's show the next night, and I remember your comment stuck in my head. You're like, Tough town, baby. You're like you're like on the marquee for 24 hours, getting replaced by Michael Q the next day. You remember that? Yeah, it's who, a cold business, man. I, I think it was Roddy Piper. No, 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 no. It wasn't. It was Roddy Piper because that Taylor actually, Negron. Yeah, that's who it was. Who uh, many of you know is the uh, pizza man and uh, Fast Times at Richmond High. Certainly more than that, but uh, that's probably the studying about Cuba, eating some food. Yeah, yeah. And uh, who ordered the large double cheese with sausage? Right here, dude. And, uh, and then he was in the Rodney Dangerfield movie. Be easy money and uh, he was, uh, uh, Tom Hanks stand up. Was movie. he a good stand up? I liked him, but I liked those older comics, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and he picked up on me once at Coons Hardware. Oh, really? Yeah, which is the local uh, gay hardware store. But it's an amazing, it's the best. You know, if you're in LA and you need something, don't go to Home Depot, don't go to, you know, Walmart or Costco. Coons Hardware, and I, I don't get uh, sponsored <coughs> by them. Uh, on uh, San Vicente and Santa Monica, it's it's the greatest hardware store, and they're all lifers in there that work there. So, like, if you need a specialized screw or nail, they'll have it. And oh, that's cool. They'll give you the Wikipedia page on the fucking nail, and uh, some great inter some great business interactions I've had there. Mm -hmm. uh, like one time, uh, I was uh, you know I collect hockey jerseys, uh, game worn jerseys, and uh, I wanted to frame one because it was very it had like. Six Hall of Fame autographs on it. Is like, that the well, one with blood in it? Yeah. On your thing? I noticed that when I walked in. It's got Scotty Bowman's autograph, uh, Mickey Redman, where, you know, uh, Brendan Shanahan. And uh, so I go in there. I'm like, yeah, I need uh, I need some caulking. And this gay guy behind me is like, I bet you do. Are you serious? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I'm going to need a stud finder. To, uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, so do I, honey. <laughs> and uh, just like, it's, and then Taylor Negron tried to pick up on me once uh, when I was looking at shower heads. Uh, what do you say? He just slithers up next to me and goes, I'm having a dinner party tonight. Would you like to come? I'm like, uh, oh my. And I was starstruck because I instantly knew who he was. I'm like, Jesus Christ, it's the pizza guy from uh, Fast Times. I'm like, well, who else is going to be there? He's like, just me. <laughs> and uh, you know, I said, oh, I'm busy, man, but thank you. That's so funny. But we're going to get into your story. Enough about me. No, uh, that's all good, dude. Trapsy Nora. Because you do a podcast with Sam Tripoli and Chelsea Skidmore. Yeah. And what is it called? The International Bad Boys Podcast. So, and you guys just talk about... Uh, we have a guest come on every week. We we do like a little weekend review because we're all psychopaths. So we all got weird stuff going on. And then we bring in a guest every week who's just got a crazy story. That's it. They Sometimes they're comics. Sometimes they're... You know, the thing is you got to have a crazy story you got like about you give you tell two 20 minute stories or one 45 minute story we give you the last about the last hour just to let it rip and we've had some really crazy shit on there trying to get a guy i had a, I had a, a childhood acquaintance who got arrested trying to break into nasa or you know got caught stealing gold from nasa or, or silver from a spaceship because i we grew up in pasadena and he got nailed uh, uh, he stole space plans and something off of a spaceship with with this huge organization of people got caught. We've tried to get him on the thing on the show, but he's like he's like hit or miss. Like oh, I want to, I don't want to. But so with like that kind of caliber of like weird level ten, we had a we had a huge drug dealer on last week. He was like I don't care, they can come and get me, and he told us all of his secrets. So we just have these crazy crazy stories. Well, it's tough to get uh, people to talk about it you know to come to, just to get people to come to you like in your case the studio in my case my home mm -hmm. uh you know so it's some you gotta like stand out in the podcast world so yeah uh, 
you know, I would go on that uh, podcast to tell my gangbang story. But what's your gangbang story? You know, I so the people who listen to this podcast have heard it a hundred times. But uh, what's the log line? The log line is uh, nine of my friends had met this chick uh, at the Four Seasons on Doheny. And uh, about eight hours later, they were nice enough to call me uh, after they eight hours later. Uh, and they were all high level agents and managers. Uh, <laughs> and it was actually the group of guys who got me into comedy. And uh, Sam Tripoli. No, no, it's uh, no, no. I, you know, one guy's still active in the business. It's funny. They said, get into comedy. We'll help you just start doing open mics. And then once you, you know, a couple months in, we'll, yeah, we'll get, get you going. And then. I start comedy and they all leave to get into real estate. How funny. These fucking bastards. 15 years later, I'm doing a character at the comedy store called The House Racist, <laughs> um, which will probably get me more than anything I've ever done before. Uh, and uh, so I go over there and it's a horror show. It just it looked like that opening scene in Saving Private Ryan. There's bodies everywhere, condom boxes, uh, underwear everywhere, and this girl who looked like you know, Blackie Lawless after the fourth encore of, uh, from a Wasp concert. Uh, actually, they never got four encores. But uh, So I ended up doing my thing with her, and, and I gave her a ride home. And uh, she was naked in my car, but she had a automobile jacket on that said Shelby Motors. And I said, oh, my God, you know Carol Shelby. I'm a huge car fan. You know, the Cobra Mustang's like the greatest car ever. Uh, American car anyway and she's like no I'm that's my husband oh my god and I mean I'm leaving out a lot of story part of the story and then uh you know I used to work at a gym sports connection in Santa Monica which uh, if you're a movie buff that's the movie uh that's the gym uh the movie perfect was filmed at with uh, John Travolta and uh oh wow uh. it's like an 80s meat market you know gyms or meat markets it's just a stupid movie but uh so, uh, you know, I had a couple steroid buddies I told the story to, and they're like, we got to meet this girl. And then, so they go over to the hotel, which was owned by Donald Sterling, um, Beverly Glen in Wilshire. I think it's called Sterling Plaza. Uh, and three days later, they call me. I'm like, hey, how was it? She's wild, right? And they're like, uh, we're still here, dude. Oh, my God. Like, she she just had a sexual appetite. Like, no one I've ever met since, before, after, in the future. And then uh, I told, you know, so all my buddies started getting wind of this. They'd go over there, do their thing. And then uh, we ha can I tell you about a girl? The police. But I mean, yeah, enough about me. No, she no, no. You just reminded me. Of this. So there was I was telling someone the other day, there was this girl that when we had like we were all big cokeheads and junkies and stuff. And there was this girl that would come over. And uh, my friend was my friend started boner. He worked at cost plus in Glendale and he met this girl and he's like, bring over bring over this girl, whatever. I'm going to bring her over. And she blew all of us, right? And she gave all of us her number. And she's like, hey, if you ever want me to come back and just blow you, call me. And I was like, oh, well, she's a prostitute. You know, she just gave us a freebie. And so we were all, we were all like the next, okay, so like a couple days later, I'm doing coke at my place. This is when I lived in Glendale. It's like 2002, 2003. So I'm doing blow at my place. I call her. I was like, hey, what's up? She's like, oh, you know, I'm busy. I'm with someone right now, but I could be over in like an hour. I'm like, yeah, sure. Come over an hour. She comes over, blows me and bounces. I'm like, oh, I forgot to fucking pay her. Takes me two or three more times to realize that she's just on call to have sex with people for free. And she just does it all day and she loves it. So I would be over fucking her. And then all of a sudden her phone's just blown up and it's all my friends. You know, so while I'm fucking her, I'm picking up and I'm like, yeah, bro, she's busy. They're like, God damn it. Just let her come over. So this happened for an entire summer where... We all just had sex on call all the time. Um, and then one day, I, I was in Old Town, Pasadena. I'm wasted. I run into her at a bar. I mean, this, this is a girl that, that hooked up with me, my brother, and then my, my friend and his brother all at the same night at a nightclub. And we're all, I'm like, hey, dude, I banged so-and-so. And they're like, I did. I did. I did. And, and we all hooked up with her in the meat locker, unknowing the vegetable locker. I put a zucchini squash up her pussy. And like then – we all did this un unknowing like that the other person was doing this and just sharing show you know uh stories at the end of the night but so one day it was so heartbreaking when she stopped doing it um i was i was in old town pasadena i ran into her and she's like 
she's like, I'm seeing somebody now. I'm like, yeah, whatever. She's like, you can come over, but I'm seeing somebody. And she, and I went over and she didn't fuck me. And I was like, no. And so the phone's blowing up like always. And she went to use the restroom. I'm calling all my friends. I'm like, it's done. I just kept picking up the phone going, it's done. Her phone going, it's done. It's done. They're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, it's done. And dude, she never fucked any of us again. She ended up dying. She got hit by a train about five years ago. And what then, kind of train? Uh, they're black guys. They're cool. Hey, uh, Miami Dolphins. Um, yeah. So yeah, that was that was a good one. That was a good little ditty. Um, I've been to a lot of bukkakis my whole life. I've done I, those. Yeah. Have you done them? Well, I mean, not intentional. I just, uh, you know, my friends were like sick, perverted, just animals. So. Well, there's the bukkake hotline that I used to call up. Oh, okay. The, yeah. No, these were. Like, hey, this is Jim Powers, the bukkake hotline. Welcome. It was like an old rave hotline from the '90s where they would tell you you would call the hotline. And they would tell you what desert party to go to. This was a bukkake hotline, and they would tell you what warehouse to go to. And then 150 random people would show up. And just jerk off on a girl's face. I would always go. I have a video out. I'd always go in a karate suit and just hang out and interview the guys with a microphone like this while they're jerking off on the girl. And I put together this video set to a Madonna uh, song. I sent it to Eddie Ift. He said it's the sickest thing. Tripoli was like grossed out by it. I have it. I could send it to you. It's the no, sickest thing. All right, all right. I don't have a stomach for that stuff. Yeah, and a lot of people don't. I really like. You know, I, I I'm not a big porn guy. Really? Yeah, I just it's the close ups. Uh, uh, you know, just I have an unnamed comic uh, who sends me like squirting pictures and Jason just, Tebow. Um, you're real close, uh, Sam Tripoli. Well, I don't want to name him, but right. uh, you can really learn a lot of things from this guy. Wow. Um, you know, but I just I see these pictures and it's just like it's I, I don't like the close ups. It's I mean, like I have a 75 inch TV. It's it, it's beautiful. It's too much. You what you the know? Porn, yeah. You just saw the hockey game on it. It's it's Beautiful. like it's like you're watching a video game. Yeah. Uh, and porn on this thing is uh, it's the guy's balls look like the moon. Have you seen porn on this thing? Yeah. It's it's you know the girl's uh, vagina after a scene with Mandingo and and uh, Castro looks like that thing Boba Fett fell into, <laughs> and uh, so it's not. I don't. I've never really found it appealing. Yeah. But I'm in the minority. Obviously, it's a billion-dollar business. I'm not watching it anymore. I haven't since October 4th. Did you have an addiction? Yeah. No more no more porn, masturbation, or orgasm until I cycle down. You mean you don't jack off anymore? I haven't since October 4th. Oh, my God. I, I don't think I could do that. All the stuff's like coming, like just, and I'm just getting enlightened. But another comic who I won't name... Uh, uh, well, I, I guess I could name him because it's not a dirty story. Kirk Fox told me, "Save it, don't jack off. Just it builds up your chi." And, it does, and, and you know he he is right. And I don't think he wants to hear this, but every time I want to jack off, I think of him. Yeah, that would help. Yeah, I'm like, all right, what would Kirk Fox do? He doesn't jack off. Apparently not. Yeah, but uh, you, you know, can tell he's on the razor's edge most times, most days. But it is uh, if you can maintain. Uh, that initial uh, or sustain that initial five minute like I gotta jack off right now. That it's always when I wake up and when I go to bed. Those are the two hardest times for me. You know, uh, I, I, I yeah. I mean, I like to do it before I go to bed because I get tired, and it's a great way to just go right to sleep. Yeah, it's it's a nightcap for yourself. So uh, yeah. Then you know, with this whole Lamar Odom dick pill thing, what are your thoughts on that? On him, what like what, what are my thoughts on the whole situation? Well, I mean, you're an MB. I mean, like we're comics. We're, mm -hmm. you know, uh, do you ever see yourself getting to be such a famous comic that it, it, your world comes crashing down in a brothel in Vegas because you you've taken ten dick pills in three days? Now I've experimented with those things. You can't take ten in three days. You'll, you'll the only drug that I haven't abused has been the dick pill drugs because I'm going to need those one day. I've abused every single other drug on the planet. How old are you? 35. I mean, I'm 47. And, you know, I take them for maintenance. Yeah. You do? Yeah, oh, absolutely, man. You know, Like every day? Oh, no. I would never take I take like one a week. Yeah, all right. There's one at 7-Eleven. It, it's like... You know, and they work? Yeah, I mean, they... Uh, I mean, I've never done a drug or drink in my life. Yeah. So, so my body's pretty pure. Like, it's... You know, all systems are... You know, I probably have the insides of a 20-year-old. No, you do. Yeah, you're in very good shape. 
Well, I'm getting a little bit of a belly, but because uh, I eat late at night. That's the hardest thing to stop. Yeah, well, yeah, because we're comics. Our clock is so opposite. I get off at 3, 2.30, and I'm like, it's 4 in the morning. The taco trucks are open. I'll just pick my face out, and I'm like, fuck. You yeah, know? or, you, you know, you go to uh, – I go to the pavilions right down the street, and it's the greatest. If you're in uh, California, you must go to this pavilions after 2, p- 2 a.m., because it's nothing but comics, bartenders, and strippers. No shit. And it's just why or prostitutes. Like the rock and roll Ralphs. It's like the gay rock and roll Ralphs, but there's enough straight people in there where it's like a cool mix. Yeah, it's just a cool club. Yeah, and there's like gay nightclubs all over the place, uh, but they're straightening them up. They the are? Bar- yeah, like the Abbey is uh, more or less a gay bar, but uh, I would say it's 30 to it's 30% straight. Yeah, I, I like the Abbey. I think the Abbey's cool, man. Oh, it's a great scene. Uh, you know, Pump is like from that show Vanderpump Rules. Is I don't know if it's a gay restaurant, but it's it's pretty gay. But uh, you know, all the servers and bartenders and and you know, late night crawlers uh, go to pavilions to stock. Up. Oh, I gotta check it out. Yeah, yeah. If you, well, you're in. Uh, you're Venice. by the beach. I can't stand Venice. I'm done with Venice, dude. Like, I just ended up there after a rough breakup, just randomly, because my brother was living in this building. I got a, I got a room. It's just, it's just a thrash pad. It's right by the wall. I could hear the waves crashing from my room, but it still doesn't matter. I could hear junkies screaming and crying. People are constantly naked. Uh, like, like it's just crackhead. It's, you know, I describe Venice as it's like if the, the uh, ride from Disneyland. Pirates of the Caribbean became self-realized and then turned on itself. Right. It's just like, rah, rah, just pirates. Well, I mean, Venice is a weird scene. Ugh. You've got the bodybuilding circuit and Gold's Gym. You've got, you know. Acid casualties. It's the drainage ditch. If you, the the great push out west, it's it all ends in Venice. So it just, it's just like the drain of a fucking never-ending shower. And just with all the soap scum, the pubes, and the cum just pile up. Yeah, I mean, that's, well, I get that here in West Hollywood, but, you know, that's a whole different. Uh, it's a whole different ball of wax. Yeah, it's it's a ball of something. I mean, there was two guys the other night boning in my driveway. Yeah. As I'm pulling up to come in, and they literally didn't stop boning. They both did, like, the penguin shuffle to, like, so I could squeeze my car in my garage. It's oh, like, how funny. It's crazy. But it's crazy, but it's like, okay, okay, there it is, you know. Boys will be boys. Yeah, and separate them with a crowbar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, let's get into your journey into comedy. Because, yeah. you know, here we're like 30 minutes in. We've talked about gangbangs, heroin. Uh, now, I, it's interesting because, you know, I do comedy completely sober. It's the most frightening thing on earth. Most frightening thing on earth. And you, when, when did you start doing it? Okay, you ready for it? Please, dude. For, okay, first time on stage, I go in 2006. I said, This is it. I'm ready. I was doing heroin at the time. I was doing real estate. Um, and I was living at my dad's house. And I was like, This is it. I'm fucking ready to rock. I went out and made flyers, these really crazy flyers of a picture of me kissing myself. My, my best friend, Casey Maloney, uh, uh, made them. And I got like, I didn't know what I was doing, right? So I, I flyered my first show that I put on featuring myself at a bar. And I was on heroin. So I was like really, really high and falling half asleep all the time and just wrecking shit. And it was right at the end, right before rehab. And I was going to take a shot. I was really into Gigi Allen. You know who Gigi Allen is? Didn't he shit on the crowd or shit something? Shit on the crowd, cut his dick off and ended up overdosing. But Gigi Allen, Todd Phillips, who did all the... All the movies that you know, the hated or happiness, hated. Or something? It was hated, hated. He did hated. He he was the one that produced and directed Gigi's movie. If you've ever seen a documentary, just go to hated. G G G period G period Allen A L L E N G G Allen. I met him by accident when I was twelve years old, and it changed my entire life. I was I was doing it. Can I stand up? I'm getting hyper now. You can do whatever you want. I'm just googling uh, hated uh, G G Allen and just to get the right name of the movie because my fans are detail oriented. Are they really? Here oh, we they go. yell at me if I uh, you know when we have a wrestling podcast and I'll get a uh, no. I'm I pay-per-view. fact check all this. Fact check all this. This is real deal shit. So ninety two, I I me and my my friend Casey Maloney, same guy, known him since eighty four. Here we go. Uh, he and I did a. A book report on Japan. So we went to Little Tokyo in Los Angeles in '92. 
I'm with his Japanese mom. He's half Japanese and our friend Chris Molina. We're walking through. So you're about 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. We're walking through little Tokyo on 2nd and Los Angeles Street uh, in, in downtown at like 11 at night. So it's in seventh grade, I'm like, wow, it's school night. It's crazy. And our older cousins, my, my one friend's older cousins who are about your age, you to me difference. They're so we're 12. They're like 22. They're all sitting there smoking cigarettes with their long hair and like 92. They're like, you guys got to get out of here, dude. We just randomly saw him on a street and, and the mom was like, well, what's happening? They're like, Gigi Allen's about to come around. And I'm like, Gigi Allen, all of a sudden, all these naked, topless chicks. So I'm 12, are all around. There's video cameras, all these punk rockers around. And all of a sudden, this naked guy without a dick, he had cut off his dick. This naked guy without a dick starts kicking in the shop window. And I was like, I don't want to leave. I need, you know, I was in your seventh grade. I'm like, I need to see this. Like, what the fuck is it? Changed my life. I'm like, what is this? And this whole mob was following this guy around, and he was supposed to kill himself that Halloween. He's, like, he's going to kill himself in a few days. He's Jesus coming back. And, I, and it changed my life. And so we were at – so the mom ushered us away and took us home. Like two weeks later or whatever, I'm at Poobah Record, which is an old record place in Pasadena. It was kind of like this legendary place. And my friend goes, you remember that guy, Gigi Allen? I go, yeah. He holds up a record with him dead on the cover holding a Jack Daniels bottle, bottle in a casket. And he's like, this is that dude. I'm like, we just saw that dude. He's like, he's dead now. And so he had overdosed he, right before he was supposed to kill himself. And so I was just hooked on that guy ever since. Performance art, he's one of my favorite performance artists. He's just a crazy dude. So I, I was all heroined out. This is now 10 years, 15 years later. This is in 2006. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to do stand-up mix with Gigi. So I was going to take – thank God I didn't do this. I was going to take – because they, they whisked me away to rehab shortly after this. But I was going to take a Who's shotgun. That? My parents, my oh. family. I was going to take a shotgun and shoot out. There's this place called – I think it was like the Blue Moon or something moon in La Crescenta, California. I called them up. I said, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a stand-up night there. They said, totally cool. We do stand-up here. And I said, all right, I want to rent it out Wednesday or whatever. They're like, totally free. Just, just go in and do your thing. And so I, I had like a thousand flyers made up these glossy, like rave looking flyers. And I sent them everywhere. I flyered everywhere, told all my friends, I'm like, shit's going to go down. Well, dude, like 80 or a hundred of my friends came. Cause you know, when you first start doing stand up, everybody's supportive and they actually come to your shows. Now it's like, dude, I can't get one person out. But, um, but everybody came in, in to this bar and I, and I was shooting up and we started a mini riot there. Um, like all this fucking crazy shit happened. And I was like, I told my friend, I'm going to take a shotgun because I owned a shotgun. I'm going to shoot out because it was in the second story. I'm going to shoot out the shop window while I'm performing on stage. And my friend's like, no, you need to do that three, three down the road. So I was already planning to shoot out a shop window and I did stand up and, and I guess I was falling asleep. I, I did because I was so nervous. I did a bunch of heroin before so it's on video. I still haven't seen it. I don't know where the video is, but I would. I was like dozing off and as I would doze off and hit the mic, it'd go and it'd make that doom sound and I would wake back up and not know that I was missing time. So I thought I was just doing a set, which right. was just rambling, going crazy. And I was like passing out and being woken up on the mic and I get, there's a, there's a uh, big thing for me to go to rehab afterwards there. And I was like, you guys are just hating on my success. I was out of my, I was like ha obsessed with Howard Hughes during this period. I would always go over to where Howard Hughes at, at uh, uh, 3000 or whatever, Romaine, right by that cement mixing factory. That's where Howard Hughes ran the country. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, cause I, I got obsessed with it. All I did towards the end of my, of my, my heroin days was I watched the aviator three times a day, every day for two years, every day for two years, I would just sit at home and watch the aviator and my boxers are naked shooting up heroin over. I got, I had this fixation with the movie, the aviator about Howard Hughes. And so in the aviator, I got this book on Howard Hughes and they were like, he ran the country out of uh, the street on Romaine and La Brea. Uh, like there's a building. It's still there. It's a really cool clothing store on, on the bottom, but that's where he would, you know, did his whole fucking weirding out before he took over the Sands Casino in Las Vegas. That's where his LA headquarters was, and that's where all the weird shit happened. So I would just go outside of there and shoot heroin and try to like summon. I thought I was Howard Hughes that that had come back to life. I really truly believe that. Um, so, so and how were you financing all these drugs you were getting? Like, cause what re were you real estate and restaurants? I worked. I always work. I work. I work like seventy hours a week. So I would. I would. 
Heroin made me fat. I was like the Chris Farley um, and John Belushi variety. Like I would shoot it and just want to go eat a steak. And then I also am a workaholic still. And I would do. I would shoot heroin and be like, let's fucking work. Like I liked working high. So I would always work. I would always, at the end of the day, I was always at zero. But I'd wake up, work at a restaurant, make 150 bucks. Okay, cool. I'm doing real estate on the side. This check just came in. I would, I would go, I would wake up. I would go work the morning shift at a restaurant on my days off of real estate. Um, and I would make 150 bucks. I'll go to Skid Row, buy $150 worth of heroin, be like, oh shit, this shit's running out. I would come back to the restaurant and I'd be like, hey, I want to work a shift. No one would want to give up their shift. So I'd like pay people. Look, I'll pay you $30 for your shift. So I pay someone $30. Like this, I got fired from the home, re- you know, home restaurant in, uh, on Vermont and Los Feliz where you eat outside in the trees. Yeah, yeah. That's where I worked. That, they fired me because I threw an ashtray at this guy at a breakdown. I had to freak out. But I, I would work there. So I'd go straight downtown, come back, um, and then work work the night shift to have enough money for heroin in the morning. And it was just, dude, I would just, just fucking just workaholic crazy. But uh, but then I did, an, I did another show. I did two shows right after that. So I did another show in Old Town Pasadena at the Old Town Pub, rented out another place, had my, I bought all this fake movie glass, like this br- movie breaking glass and stuff like, like fake ashtrays, fake steins. And I set it, set it up all in the restaurant. I had blood capsules. And so I had someone pop off from the crowd, a friend that no one else knew. And so he's like, fuck you. I'm going to kick your ass. And he walked up and broke a fake pint glass on my face and I bit the blood capsule and then a riot started. And we tore we tore apart this whole fucking building. It just I, I have pictures of it too, dude. I can show you pictures of me just covered in fake blood, but just getting actually like getting I got my ass beat, dude. Because then it sparked a real riot, and then after that, everybody was like, "You need to go to rehab. You're out of here." So then I went to rehab, and like in in rehab, I was like, "Yeah, I'm a fucking comedian." So that's right, right when I came out, like 2009 ish, like I met Tripoli, and he was like, "What's your deal?" I'm like, "I'm a stand up." He's like, "Oh, I am too. Let's go on the road." And I didn't have any. You know, I just fucking ate my dick at like La Jolla Comedy Store. I walked up there and all these Marines were just talking shit. And I was, I, I didn't know what was going on. And, I, and then I kind of got freaked out. I did stand up for like, I, after like being sober for a year, I did stand up for a year. And, and uh, you know, it was like, dude, it's, it's nerve wracking, man. It's really nerve wracking. And I, you know, I, I, I will admit it. Like it was too much for me that, that early on in sobriety, I stopped. I did improv for the last five years and now I've been back doing stand up for a year and I'm, I'm emotionally ready to handle the re- constant stream of rejection and uh other people judging you and you judging yourself like i'm i'm finally emotionally balanced enough to do stand up it's it's such a it's such a brutal thing and so to be popped out of the womb of heroin where nothing can hurt your feelings you're just in this bubble to being popped out right into into stand up was just the craziest thing i ever did so now now yeah now i'm working at the comedy store met you and uh doing stand up like five nights a week as much as i can get up now, do you ever uh, fear, uh, is, is it a constant fear of uh, if you have a bad set, you'll get tempted to do drugs again? No, it, what, what it replaced it with sex addiction. What replaced it was just f- const- constant fucking, just anything that walked in front of me. And so now I'm like almost a month off of doing that. So the, for the last seven years of my sobriety, I, I replaced it with sex. You've I been just, sober for seven years? Yeah. You haven't done heroin for seven years? Not heroin, weed, alcohol, nothing. That's great. And how do, is it t- like people? I get this question all the time. How are you sober your whole life and you're at not the comedy store, but just in comedy in general? It's almost easier for me. It's like if you really have to make a commitment, like my 12 step sponsor is a bartender. It's like if you're really ready to stop something, you're ready to stop something. So it's almost like, you know what, Earl? I get more tempted on a Wednesday just walking around with that lonely feeling than I do at the comedy store if people have blow or if I tell people are stoned. That's too obvious. It's almost like I'm not going to relapse. Or if I was a food addict, I'm not, I'm not going to relapse at the buffet. I'm going to go get a 7-Eleven Twinkie on a Wednesday. It, it's, it's too obvious. It's so, it's so in your face at the store, it doesn't even look good to me. In fact, I see I see most people, most of really good friends and very talented people. It helps me wrecking their fucking career and being like walking in the store, looking all nice, hair combed, on fire, and then four hours later being like, you know what? I'm gonna tell this person what I really think and just dropping the ball. And I'm like, thank God I'm sober. Oh yeah, dude, I see a lot of. Comments. You see it too. You're you're you and I are probably the only two people that are sober at that building. Uh yeah, I mean you know I see a lot of well Tebow uh, Jason Tebow is now uh, sober sober and that's cool and uh, love think, him yeah he's the best it's it's really he introduced good. me to Adam and so Jason so I I had been away Sam walked me right into the comedy store it accepted me five years ago I met everybody met all these people and I got spooked and went away and I I didn't go back to the store for five years it was a it was a sign of my failure it was a a dark place and I I was just like. 
I was so um, bitter at myself for running away fr from stand up that I just didn't go. You know, I did improv and stuff, which is, I think, an easier. Like the ground line stuff? I did like UCB. That? I went to UCB and did all their, you know, graduated their, their program and did a lot of, you know, I did stand up maybe like over the last five years, like once a week or once every other week, kind of kept the tone. It would do these little indie shows, but not really like hanging out, showing up, putting your balls out there. And, and um, you know, then I went, to, you know, came back to the store about a year ago and just to say what's up to Tebow, Tebow and Tripoli and see what they were doing and met Adam and fucking they're like, yeah, there's, you know, there's a new guy like it's, it's you know, I didn't even know who Adam was, but there was like, oh, it's because it just was there's a darkness that I just didn't enjoy three or four years ago. I just I just didn't like the vibe of the store. It wasn't my thing. The store ain't for everybody. Yeah, it's not. But it's a little more. Uh, it's different now. It's light. It's a little more business like now, you know, the. uh when the show is over now, the room is instantly shut down. So the tours have, the legendary comedy the sex tours, tours. Uh, have uh, they haven't ceased, but they no, there's still you just there's still some spots. They've definitely been uh, curtailed, <laughs> but uh, you know the store is still the best club on earth. Number one best club on earth. I mean, I love the improv. Uh, you know, you know the note I keep getting. There's other stores. There's other stores. That's a Freudian slip right there. There's other clubs be, besides the store, and it's like I don't enjoy performing at them. I I feel like if I perform at another club and I do well, it's like, well, dude, how would I have done at the comedy store? Because it's such a hard wave to ride. I feel like it's almost like if you go to the Ice House and you crush, like, did I really crush? Oh yeah, if you that's crush like a at the fucking paid yeah. audience, you know what I mean? If you crush at the store, you're good. You're cr that's well, so it's like it's like. After knowing that that's the hardest wave to ride, being a glutton for punishment and perfectionist, I going to get in the cheap laughs at flappers. Or, you know, I'll believe me, I'm not shitting on any other club. I'll do any other show if, if anybody has me. But it's just like for me, I'm like, yeah, but this would like would this how would this have gone in the OR? You have to really hit it hard in order to. Oh get, yeah, get the OR. There. I've seen the biggest names in the country bomb in that room. Uh, it's not a very forgiving room and. Once you uh, lose them, it's very hard to get them back. Yeah, you got to hurt yourself or something. Believe me, I, you have to whip out your dick or like... Yeah, I've seen it. I've done it. I've seen you do it. You know, you've got to like then get into... If that if you're not feeling the mood to do that, and some nights I'm not, you know, you got to go into real dark material and, uh, you know, say things you're probably not comfortable saying. Yeah, but uh, reveal things you're not comfortable revealing. Yeah, like you know, I, I think uh, a couple of weeks ago I was having maybe a soft set, and uh, I got into the story of the first time I heard the N word, and uh, it's, just, it's a story I've never told on stage before because I don't say that word uh, in public. But uh, I, I said, yeah, it we on, said it a whole bunch before the podcast started. Yeah, or... I mean, well, I get it out of the way. Okay, but I said it on stage for the very first time in the crowd, and there was. Uh, many uh, brothers in the crowd who love the joke. It's it's really a I won't say a great joke, but it's a great story because it's true. Uh, whoa, whoa! I whoa, thought whoa. we Jason got Tebow's calling. Jason Tebow calling in. Unfortunately, we don't do uh, call-ins on the show, uh, but uh, you know we're not uh, technologically we're about as up to date as your website. Should I take, should I take a a speaker call? But I don't th I, I don't think that would work, you know. Okay, uh, okay. There's been one phone call ever on Inappropriate Earl. And who was that? That was the legendary uh Don Fry took a phone call from his daughter. Oh. Yeah, uh, uh, during the show and uh if you know who Don Fry is, he fought in the first couple UFCs. Yeah, I remember Don Fry, yeah. Big mustache. Yeah, he, yeah, looked like a cop. He looked like Tom Selleck. Yeah. Uh he I mean, he fought in the UFC when it was still ball punching and biting and yeah, I loud. mean, literally, you, you didn't have sponsors <laughs> back then, so you would come out to the octagon in a hoodie from your closet. Like I it, saw the first. Well, we always had illegal cable growing up. We always had the uh, the black box cable. My cousin was in the the illegal cable business, so since the eighties, we just had streaming pay per view nonstop. You know, so I remember I was sitting there and I was just like, Dad. Get in here. He's like, what? I'm like, there's people fighting hard on, you know, just the first one. I, the, the TV just interrupted and showed it. And it was just like, holy shit. Just blood everywhere. Well, I mean, I remember uh, having to go to like Best Buy and buy the VHS tapes. I oh, mean, yeah. Uh, I used to get uh, Faces of Death that way. 
Oh, I I loved uh, Faces I got a, of Death. I got addicted to Faces of Death. Well, I I stopped watching after I think they showed uh, like a cat being skinned alive. Or oh, so. I don't like that. Uh, I I don't mind seeing a guy get run over by a bus or something. I could I could tolerate that, but. Uh, when I saw that, it was either a cat or a dog or a, a monkey, I think. Uh, it's like Korea or something. They, yeah. It's like, oh, It's boy. always Korea. I had this video called Shocking Asia that was just, ooh, Yeah. Smoke I, a little bowl of weed and put that on, change the mood real fast. You I know? just can't. Uh, I mean, I can't even watch that scene in American Psycho where Christian Bale kicks the dog in the alley. I have to like. I, I, I lost my stomach for gore, dude. I, I can't do it anymore. I can't. I can't do it anymore. Well, I mean, what uh, when you what is your comedy like for fans who like want to? First my, of all, where can they look you up at? Like YouTube or yeah, you, YouTube? My YouTube presence is weak. Uh, I would say my strongest suit. What I am as a storyteller. Yeah. Oh, dude! The night I saw you, when I first saw you, uh, it was at Potluck, and you were telling some story about you. Uh, and you can repeat it here. I think it was you were doing heroin. You had stitches in your chest. Oh, yeah. Uh, you were fucking some girl, uh, and the stitches were popping out. You're bleeding. She thinks you're a, like an alien. And She it, thought I was an undercover cop because she was a, a dominatrix hooker. Right. And it, I but, just had male breast reduction surgery, and I woke up from surgery. That was my last time using drugs and alcohol. They were like, you can't. I was like, because they shot me up with something to put me asleep. And so I fucking just, uh, you know, long story short, right out of No, rehab. no, don't make it long story short. All right. You want me to tell the, the tit story? Tell the story. But let me just say that uh, I was walking by the, the OR uh, room. You were on stage telling this story. And I was like, wow, who is this guy? Because I've, I've been to Potluck a few times. And that's the... Uh, not the amateur night, but the uh, audition night, if you will. It's the audition night where the not only the employees, but uh, friends of the store, uh, young uh, upcoming talent, uh, basically, uh, uh, it's their only night to shine, I guess you'd say, uh, because the rest of the nights are uh, paid regulars and, and famous comics. And you know, stage time, I don't think people realize this about comedy. is it's, it's incredibly hard to get at the comedy store. Oh, that's right. I love people go... Uh, People go, just go do a bunch of sets at the store and show them. You know, like are people that are outside the business is like, you don't fucking get what goes on to putting your little feet on that stage. Yeah, I mean, you even when you walk into the comedy store at, you know, 1245 on a Sunday night, which coincidentally is my next spot. Hey -o. Uh, hey oh no i'm not complaining listen i don't deserve any uh, adam uh, i'm 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 on board uh but even you think oh wow this person must not be very good no it's a premium it's, it's a, always you know there's it, no dead air there yeah if you see uh someone going on at 12 45 or, or one o'clock 1 15 they're good it's just that's uh, hard fought time like you're not it's, it's all at a premium yeah, yeah, I mean, it's uh, incredibly hard to get stage time there. So uh, Monday nights is, uh, you know, the audition night. And so you, you see a lot of young. It's kind of a legendary night. It's, 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 it's the, okay, you think you're funny? Prove it. You got, you got three minutes right now to do your thing. And you don't have a lot of audience most times. Most English-speaking audience. It's mostly French tourists. For me, it's the hardest room to do. I've been doing potluck every Monday for the last year, and I will say that, you know, I go to auditions, I do a lot of shit, and it's, I just did 33 minutes in Long Beach, uh, shit, last Tuesday. Harvell's. Harvell's, yeah. Have you done Harvell's? I have not. Tuesday night's hot room in Long Beach, if you want to see Steven. So fun. So fun. Dude, we got to go. We got to go together. Yeah, I, uh, the only, uh, it's uh, roast battles oh, that that's night, right. and, you know, I'm, I'm so fucking paranoid, I, I'm going to miss miss something. something i i feel like that with potluck i'm like the i went to hawaii this summer and i was like oh, i'm gonna miss potluck and i'm not i'm gonna never be famous you know i just fucking get all crazy but uh uh it's 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 the most intimidating because earlier you're already passed you know so you're like you've you're made you're in the mafia dude yeah for, but for the, still it's no uh just because you're past oh really the anything. bullshit doesn't stop oh no oh, I, I, mean, I always think once i get past then i can let out a sigh of fresh air and Oh, not at all. The bullshit just begins. I really? Mean, you got a lot of people running the light. You uh, got, uh, you know, it, com comics are like little kids. If the first comic runs the light, then the second guy or girl wants to. And then, so by the time I go on, I might have a 1245 spot, but I'm going on at close to two. 
because everyone runs the light. And then uh, there have been several methods tried to curb that, and no one, oh, you can't. Like Jeff Scott, he's hardcore. He'll start playing the piano. Oh, he does? No matter who you are. Like you could be uh, Dalia, you could be me, you could be uh, Eric Myers, uh, or anyone in between. He will play the piano, and then people were like, well, you can't do that. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, it ruins the vibe. And it's like, Jeff's like, I don't care about the vibe. I, you know? <laughs> Jeff is the vibe, yeah. baby. Like, yeah, he, <laughs> he really is. Yeah, welcome to Hollywood. When you go to Hollywood, you meet Jeff Scott. Yeah, I mean, legendary. <laughs> Jeff Scott, legendary piano player at the comedy store. Been we there love like him. 30 years. Uh, you know, he uh, does the in between music, in between the comics. He starts to show off. Play. He's an amazing uh, musician, and, uh, and but people would get on him. Say, "Well, you can't, you can't play music when so and so's on stage." He's like, "Listen, if everyone runs the light, we'll be here till four in the morning." And it's not fair. He actually cares about people like me and you. Like, yeah, like he wants us to get up in front of actual humans. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, we all have to. But like when I walked by the store uh, or by potluck that night, very rarely have I stopped and go, wow, this guy or girl is telling something interesting or funny. I did that with you. Oh, I appreciate it. That means the world to me, man. That means you want me to get into that story? I will because I let me just say this. Before you get into that story, I, I've done that really, to my memory, only one other time with the legendary, late, great Angelo Bowers. He was the best. He was uh, awesome. He was like, very much a Mitch Hedberg, uh, not one-liner comic, but he would tell very quick jokes that you're like, how did he write that and I didn't? Like, wh- or I should say, why didn't uh, I write that? Uh, you know, He was just an amazing writer who uh, uh, died in a car crash a couple years back. Uh, he, had the, he had the joke. He goes, every night in my apartment building, I, I – oh, God damn, I don't want to ruin it. Never mind. I don't like telling. It's too late. Tell it. You anyway. know, it, but I forgot what exactly what it was. It said he said I live in a really really sketchy apartment complex. Every night I see someone smoking meth in my mirror. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. like that was just one. Or he's like, I don't. The first time I saw him, he just walked out at potluck and he's like, everybody gets whiskey dick. I don't know what whiskey dick is. I get Taco Bell dick. And it just, everybody just starts going crazy. I was like, who the fuck is this guy? Yeah, he was just like, it was just nonstop. An amazing uh, performer. But uh, he's the only other person I've ever like, oh, wow, what's this? All right, so get to that story. (coughs) All right, so I get out of rehab. I go go to rehab and, okay, cool. I go to rehab and uh, this lady goes, uh, this counselor inside says, you know, you're running from one secret. And I always, I grew up, when I went through puberty, I had, I got tits like a girl. Like my nipples became meatballs. And uh, it was the summer before I went into high school. So like eighth grade, I got, I went and just had these meatballs in my, my tits. And I was like, oh fuck, what is this shit? You know, right around the time, you know, I started like, you know, wanting to get girls and it just really fucked with me. And um, I remember so the next the next summer I did a good job of hiding it in eighth grade. Then the next summer I went to an all boys Catholic uh, high school, and it was just ruthless. I mean, just ruthless sports, competitive, crazy Catholic high school, and I got tits. So it just like I got really funny, I got really mean, I got really you know I was always quick witted, but I was just always on the defense. Someone was going to expose that I had tits, and someone would be like Randolph's got tits, and I would just punch their face or start freaking out or deflect with a joke. So it was just nerve wracking, nerve wracking. So, you know, by the time I got into, like, <clears throat> drugs, it really helped it. When I started getting getting drunk and, and doing the tranquilizers and, you know, hardcore drugs and cocaine and meth, I didn't care that I had tits. It went away. And so um, that was the only time I was, like, happy, you know, because my posture, I started, my posture started slumping because I was always, my whole life was a damage control, like, I they can't find out about the tits. That's how I spent from 92 to 2008 i mean really honest to god dude i love the beach i wouldn't go to the beach you know i'll say the sad story but just really i was just under uh the amount of shame stress fear that i was going to get found out and it just it was just demasculinating and horrible i i you know drugs helped drugs helped that go away so if you're out there listening and you're running from one or two things find me on facebook i'll talk to anybody where do they find you on Facebook? Just Stephen Randolph, S T E V E N, last name R A N 
D O L P H. But so are there not a lot of Stephen Randolphs? Or like, you know, there, you'll you'll be able to find me because you Google me. I'm probably one of the you know I I I'm I'm pretty active on there. Like I'm a comic. You'll 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 see who it is. I have a fan page and my personal page. Add both, whatever, however you you want to reach out to me. Um, and then it's uh my my Twitter is uh Stephen Randolph S T E V E N R A N D O L P H. Then the number you know just two. So Stephen Randolph two on Twitter, Instagram, just add me. However you need to get in contact with me, but just hit me up. It's always like one or two secrets that the real fucked up. You know, when I see really drunk, druggy, crazy people, everybody goes, "Oh, look at those crazy people." It's like I know you're just running from one or two things. So you may act like you're crazy. You're it's you're just running from one or two secrets. So if you want to share those with me and get that off your chest, that's fine. Um, so so this lady said you're just running from one thing, and I was like, "Oh fuck, it's my tits." I didn't have the balls to. To tell her, I finally, um, I finally, I go home. A real estate deal from uh, almost a year back kicks in. I, I, I was doing real estate. I owed this guy money. I'd always close a real estate deal, um, these just random fucking deals, and then I would, I would spend the ten thousand or whatever, you know, the commission money, and then I would, I would hit the the brokers up that I was working for. Hey, can I get like just typical, you know druggy drunk shit hey can i get 500 advance you know i'm good for it you know i do deals and the guys would you know kick me down but like finally this one guy my my buddy marty was like dude you got a problem and then right after that he gave me like 200 bucks or something and right after that i went to rehab so then i called him and said hey you know marty i just remembered you know i've been in this place 30 days i owe you 200 bucks i just want to acknowledge that because he was a really good friend and he was like oh dude i thought you were calling about your check i'm like what check he's like oh dude a check cleared for you for ten thousand bucks you know we have waiting for you you know deal deals coming through blah, blah blah so i was like oh shit so i get out of rehab i'm in there for six months it really helped me i got i got to see a lot of stuff and i'm like uh i was so I was six months sober i relapsed once in rehab I, I i spent all night with a hooker in santa Ana on a bus that's a whole other story had, well, i got, didn't know where to go man so uh um, you what but you better finish this story i didn't know where to go would you say i got nowhere to go so i got time for the story oh, sure sure no problem um so yeah, so I I spent all night, you know, because all these guys from gangs, half the half the people coming in from rehab were in uh, were in gangs and uh, or were in a Saska program, which Arnold Schwarzenegger put into play. It's a great program. If it's like if you are doing serious prison time and they can tell you you have a drug problem, they'll they'll give you another shot if you go to rehab, you know. So they'll let you out of your prison term early. So half the guys that I was in rehab with were in Saska. They're always really, dude. The most talented, like George Perez, perfect example. There, it was like being housed with. 50 George Prezes. They're the most funny, respectful, uh, creative prisoners are so fucking talented and creative. They're just the class clowns. who just, did, just, just didn't know when to shut up, you know, or just, just get in trouble. But like prisoners, uh, you know, and I've spent a lot of time, you know, being in these rehab, you know, different, different rehabs and in recovery, I would say outside of the gay community, uh, uh, prisoners, people who have been a major prison, um, and convicts are the most talented people on the planet, most artistic, most funny, most sensitive, but they just, you know, they're just doing their thing. So, um, so a guy comes in and I just whispered to him like, where do it was in Costa Mesa and I'm from Pasadena. So that's out by Huntington beach. I'm like, where do I get heroin? He's like first in Maine, Santa Ana. That's all, you know, I, it's all I needed was that information. So I stuck me and this other dude stuffed our beds to look like someone was sleeping. Our bunk beds jumped, got on a bus went to first in Maine, found it and found heroin and were just smoking out of heroin out of food for less all night. The bu- like the bus we were on coming back got stopped by the police. They were after someone else. I, it was just it was that was a that was an advent adventures in rehab. I had more sex than I've ever had in my life inside rehab because you're just with a bunch of chicks. It was a co-ed rehab. Everybody's coming off drugs looking for something to feel better and we I mean there was just orgies. It was it, that was fun. I had a blast. But how do you uh, buy heroin? Like you go to first in Maine, you look around, you see uh, if you're if you're a white boy and you're on First and Main in Santa Ana and it's one at night and you got that desperate I need something look in your eyes, you you know okay so the the way that the same way that uh, that one comedian you said hit on you at the hardware store right. how you know he wanted to have sex but he didn't say sex you could tell by the look that like oh this gay dude wants to fuck me or like this girl wants to fuck me there's a, there's a there's a look that you give people when you you want drugs people right. if you're walking on the streets at night and you hold the look with somebody you're either looking for sex or drugs that's just period you know and so you know if you're if you're a white boy in in, in an unwhite area at, at oh, a hot wow. hour at night they know why you're down there like, hey white boy i got what you need you know they they, they know what the deal is so <clears throat> so i go down to you know get get the heroin just, just have a fucking crazy night i get caught they let me 
they let me come back. What do you mean you get reality. caught? I well, I stuffed my bed. They found out. Someone ratted on me when I snuck in at night. Uh, I snuck back into the house. The, everything was bolted. One of the convict guys that was living there was like, hey, dude, someone ratted on you, but I'll let you in for the night. I played dumb for like half a day. Then I was like, yeah, I, I fucking did. I cut out my mattress and stuffed a ball of heroin that I had bought down there. So for the next three or four days, I actually came down easy because I like I had slowly – tapered myself off with heroin you could you could shoot it up or you could liquefy a lot of guys do squishies there's there's all kinds of ways you could do you could do heroin it's a little ball of wax of tar of uh, like it looks like tree sap you know it comes in different forms but it's mostly like a gunky little tar like what you get on the bottom of your foot uh, at the beach you know when you're right. walking around put in a spoon put water in it put fire to it underneath and it sizzles and makes like a soup and that's you know that's what you shoot. So, but you could you have a gland in your nose, so you could hollow out a big pen, snort that liquid, and if it if, if it just hits your your nose, you're high as fuck. A lot of guys will put in an apron squishy uh, spray bottle and just do squishies all day in their nose. So you could take a needle and just shoot that stream into your nose without piercing anything. Just put it like a water gun up your nose, and you just. So I was doing that for like five days and rehab. My attitude changed. I was nice. To everybody I was having all these like great talks. I was like leading groups. I was like, you know, guys, you just all need to really. And then they're like, dude, something's up with this guy. So then, you know, I was like, yeah, they let me stay. Ended up staying there for another five months. Had a blast. Had once I finally kind of surrendered to the process. You're you're in a rehab. Everything's everything's paid for. You have no responsibilities. You're with all these hot girls. You're having fun. It's just like it's. I had a blast. I I had a fun time, man. There's movie night. There's this night. I chose the the movie Happiness, which you mentioned earlier by accident in the beginning of the podcast. We yeah. all got to pick a movie night. Imagine. 40 convicts and a bunch of chicks. I pick happiness. Dude, only three made it throughout the movie. They all thought I was gay and I was trying to push some agenda on What them. is happiness? Uh, happiness is the most fun. Have you ever seen that movie? Something about he jacks off and... It's a, and it's a movie about pedophilia. It's, it's fucking... Uh, uh, what's his name that passed away? The Philip guy, Seymour... Uh, Hoffman's greatest role. Uh, right. The movie Happiness is incredible. So that was... I chose to, to, to play happiness for a, a room full of crazy people. Is this going too long? No, no, no. Oh, cool. Dude. Okay, so so end up I end up the lady says you have a secret you're running from. I go home, I find out I'm getting ten thousand dollars. I Google I have this is two thousand eight. I Google the phrase I have tits. So out pops Dr. Corbin in Beverly Hills. This Jewish doctor goes, you have tits? I'm the tit doctor. He's like, I'll take those. And he had a really funny like little video. It just was like with, like rap music or something behind it. He had this funny little promo video of, of like sucking the fat out of your tits, getting it. You know, it's called the gynecomastia. So I was like, fuck, I'm not crazy. I never had the balls to even acknowledge that that was what I was running from. I, I, I put it into the Google search. I'm like, so there's an answer to this. Then the money came in. And I was like, I called Dr. Corbin. I was like, you know, I, I like... I'm a pretty good negotiator, so I was like, "Dude, I got all cash." He's like, "Well, it's ten thousand. I was like, "Can I do it for eight thousand if it's all cash?" He was like, "Yeah." I ended up going on on Christmas Eve, struck a deal with him. You know, he's like, "Well, I got a Christmas. You know, I'm Jewish. I got a Christmas Eve spot. Doesn't mean anything to me." I'm like, "It means nothing to me. Let's go." And got him down even more. So I get these fucking things sucked out. I wake up and uh, no, this was the second. I went twice. I went for a follow up on Christmas Eve. So this was this was on. May like end of May 2008. So I'm I'm out of rehab. I have the money. Um, I find out. I Google. I have tits. I'm like I'm gonna get this fucking done. Get my check. Um, I go and go to Dr. Corbin. He, he sucks the the fat of my tits. I wake up from this major surgery. It's a fucking big deal. They put me out. I have a compression bra on. So I wake up. I'm in a bra. Well, I just got shot up by a bunch of drugs and stuff like that. And I wasn't really sticking to the 12 step program. I wasn't. You know, I just was like I woke up high basically from surgery. So that's how a lot of people relapse if they're not really on it with surgery. You know, they're shooting you up with basically heroin when you go to you have surgery. So so I wake up high as fuck when I need more shit. So I'm bleeding from the tits, massive surgery. My mom, they drive me to my dad's house. I said, I had to I have to go to the seven eleven to get something. They said, You can't leave, you just had major surgery. So like an hour and a half out of major surgery, I down all the prescription uh, pain meds that they All of them. All like as many as I can. It was all Demerol. But my you know, I just I had a I was a you know, I was a glutton for heroin, and I'm, and I know everybody says that, like, oh man, my, like, you know, I, dude, I, I was a glutton for, I couldn't put enough in my system. Like, you would, I would, you would put one balloon in a spoon, and draw it, shoot it up. It would look like piss water, like rust water, like tea. I would make, we would call them, we would, we would call them pasta. What would we call them? 
espresso shots or we, me and my friend had a name we take a pasta spoon and put like three or four balloons in cook it up into a sludge it's gotta be terrible for you and it's so th- it was so thick with heroin i couldn't even it was like it was like i couldn't even get it in the syringe i would have to like fucking pull this shit it was like it wasn't even broken down and then i would put it in my arm and just pump i'd pump three or four balloons into my system and just blah, just be you know out of my fucking minds but i would just do that i i did as much heroin as I could afford, I just put it through my system constantly. All I would shoot up 15, 20, 30 times a day. I just all the time, all the time, all the time. We ended up going up. There was a – right where you live. I'm not going to rat the place out. I'm no, not, I live in West Hollywood. Yeah. But, uh, but there, was, there was a lot of fraudulent uh, tanning salons and, uh, and uh, uh, muscle – I won't say the name of it, but there were like muscle building places which were fronts for, for heroin and for steroids and for like – Really? You know, what do you think all these guys that walk around so buff? They, they're, get, they're not getting them – they're not going to some weird crack house. And you know, like a lot of the injectable drugs, you, you buy at like fronts and stuff. So I got involved with this whole – this whole thing, the, the the stories, my heroin stories are are endless. I mean, I mean, endless, endless. Tijuana shit, getting caught in you know Skid Row. This is this is this story. I, that's my problem with storytelling. Like, what am I supposed to do in the OR? I get I go into a caveat and it just keeps going. So good. To, yeah, to keep but to keep with this stream, this story. Yeah, the, the, this could break off into ninety more minutes of material. But um, so so I wake up, I call up my ex heroin dealer now my ex heroin dealer is a heroin dealer to the stars he deals oxycontin cocaine everything a mexican guy started out he got his break selling to guns and roses and this guy's been doing it for 20 plus years and he's just this hispanic guy from mexico that just has it dialed in and he just he just does famous people i i uh, happened to meet him through a friend he thought it was funny he told me one time because i I would yell at him, and, and he would be like, dude, I, he was like, the only reason I, I sell to you is because I think you're funny. You, me and my friend Casey, he's like, Poppy, I don't sell to you for money. Because it would just, you know, we would just get, he would go to sell Capitol Records, sell $30,000 worth of, you know, he would, he would sold it all. He find, he he kept Disney Magic going, this guy. So I, I, I ran into him in front of Zanku, and I tried to take his picture. It was seven years sober when I was working at the store. And I go, and he goes, he hadn't seen me in seven years. He, and, I, and he goes, why are you taking a picture of me? He's like this high-level, gnarly drug dealer. I go, for my Facebook update. And he started laughing so hard because he knew. He's like, dude, I'll kill you if you put it. You know? So I was like trying to hug him and stuff. But that's a whole other story. So I, so I call him up. He's like, I haven't talked to you in six months. What's up? I meet him on the top of Camrose Street in Hollywood. And – uh uh, Princess Leia. So there's a there's a Mercedes in front of me, and so I'm sitting there, and there's a Mercedes in front of me. I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, why is this car in front of me? So he finally gets into my car after like an hour of me waiting there. I'm out of major surgery. My my there's blood like coming through my shirt. He's like, what happened? I'm like, I had shoulder shoulder surgery. He's like, I won't sell you the cocaine. I'll only sell you the heroin and the oxycodone. I was like, no, no, no. He was like, I'm not. You're out of surgery. Why wouldn't he sell you the cocaine? Because he's like, very bad for you, Poppy. Very bad. You don't do cocaine out of surgery, you know, because it will speed up your heart. I was like, no, I want the cocaine, blah, blah. Started freaking out. He didn't want to sell it to me. So I started busting his balls. I'm like, dude, I haven't seen you, and you fucking wait to get to me, and, you know, you take an hour. And he would, dude, he was a cocky dude. He, he sold to every, and I wouldn't want to blast everybody on here, but. Everybody, the A plus number one top tier celebrities bought from this guy or their assistants did. So he, this guy was a millionaire. Just, he just had it down. He would just come in these shitty, it just had, he just had this, he will never be caught. This guy is just the Kaiser Sosa of drug dealing. And so he goes, that car in front of you, how long has that been here? Before you? I said, yeah, before. He goes, an hour before you. He goes, that's Princess Leia, homeboy. And so Fisher was waiting for an hour before me. And I was getting, he goes, you think you're better than the Princess Leia? I was like, no, I'm not better than the princess lady. He goes, that's right. I come to your car fucking first, Poppy. And, and he deals out of a Star Wars bag that she had given him. So that was a whole other. So Princess Leia was, you know, so he's like, you're giving me shit. And Princess Leia, you think you're better? You know, so that's that was crazy. So I was like, all right, cool. So he finally sells me the Coke. I take a bump. My tits started bleeding. He just got out of my car. Like, I don't want any part of this shit. So so I, right before iPhones were huge, it was like 2008. So I go to Astro Burger in West Hollywood. And I, I'm like, all right. I'm like, uh fuck i need a hooker and so i just got a, a back page or an express or whatever and i got the uh la express la express you yeah. locals yeah we, we don't need that anymore you just you know now with phones and shit but you know this is back when you had to go go to a fucking magazine so i get this dominatrix hooker she's like i'm out in the valley off tampa street so i got on the 101 all coked out out of surgery my family's blowing me up going what the fuck's going on you know, like where, where, you know, where are you? Oh my God. You know, I just went on another drug run basically, you know, uh, and that two hours out of major surgery. So I'm all bandaged up. I'm wearing a bra. Keep in mind, I'm wearing a compression bra. It looks like a bulletproof vest bra. 
you know, and um, to hold my my shit in. You know, I had, I had a pump tubes coming out of my tits, pumps to pump out the fluid. It was like I was supposed to be on bed rest. So I'm on a drug run. So I I um I go over to this hooker's house. She's like, okay, take off your clothes. And I was like, no. I was like, no. I was like, uh. I don't want to. She's like, are you a fucking cop? Take off your clothes. I took off my bottoms. My dick was like an inch big because the coke, you know, made it shrivel up. I was spooked out. So I'm like sitting there with like this little micro dick all coked out, you know, fucks up your dick. And so, and then I refused to take my top off. And then, so she was like, are you wearing a wire? And she was like, she was dressed like RoboCop. She was in all like fucking dominatrix, Russian stiletto, crazy shit. So I'm over at this house with like, you know, fucking hooks from the ceiling it looked like a trent reznor music video you know it was a real dark place and so i went in there and i was and i took off my shirt i was like i'm just had a major surgery so it was like she was just like what the what do i say to this she's a dominatrix cooker but she's like this guy just came out of major surgery i'm obviously coked out so she starts whipping me but i'm like ow it hurts i started like tearing up and so i'm so coked out i'm like i i get all weird like a spook cat i'm all freaked out and coked out so she starts whipping me whipping me and so i'm like i'm like permission to do coke mistress she's like no I'm like, permission to do coke, mister? She's like, no, because I have a bunch of blow in my book bag in there. So she had a dog collar on me, and she was trying to fuck me in the ass with a dildo, and I was just so spooked out. I was like, I, I took off the dog collar, and I started breaking down crying, and she got all freaked out. I was like, I just got out. I had male breast surgery right now. I have coke. That I just I paid you $200. Can I at least stay for a half hour and just tell you everything? And she was like. She just looked like horrified. So she goes out and she goes, do your Coke. She goes out into her bedroom, comes out five minutes later, dressed in Disney uh, pajamas. So she just went from dressed like the Robocop to Disney pajamas. So she's sitting on the ed- edge of a couch while I'm snorting Coke in a, in a bra, oozing blood out of my tits. And I told her everything. Every time anybody's ever hurt my feelings, I told her about the tits. I told her about all my failures everything and i started feeling better and she was like oh my god and she's like where do you what are you doing now my phone rang i'm like i have to go to my grandma's house my mom was like meet me at your grandma's right now she's like you can't go to you can't go to your grandma's i'm like i have to go to my grandma's right now so i do a bunch of coke go to my grandma's house my nose is fucking pouring uh milk my sister very very weird uncharacteristically was eating a jalapeno and i walked through the through the front door and she goes have a jalapeno so i just I was all spooked out. I just took a bite of this jalapeno. My nose kept running because like, I had been for like the last three hours of Coke. And so my mom goes, what is that pouring out of your nose? And my sister goes, my nose is doing it too. I, we're both eating jalapenos. And my mom just gave me a weird look. And we all just sat at this table and they were just staring at me. And I was just, you know, I was like, I got to go home and get better. I went home, watched a movie called my my sponsor from a 12 step that I've been working with before that I tried to get sober. I just said, Hey, his name's Claudio. I said, he met me at a meeting um, the next night outside the Burbank airport. And I said, I got to tell you everything. I took off my shirt. I said, I've always been ashamed of my tits. And he started laughing. I was like, dude, it's not funny. Like, fuck, I've all, you know, this is why I've used drugs. I've always been, you know, been ashamed of these, blah, blah, blah. And I told him everything. Just like I told the hooker, I told him everything. And I just felt this weight lifting off my back, just like this weight lifting off my back. And, um, and he was like, do you have any more drugs? And I had methadone because I would come down with methadone. It never worked. That was the attempt. So I was like, yeah, in a, in a swim fin in my room, I have methadone. He's like, go throw that out. I'm like, I don't want to throw that out. Let me just do those for a couple of days. And then he was like, just throw those out. So I went home, threw those out. And uh, I had ne- I've never used drugs or alcohol since. I was May 31st, 2008. And it just lifted from me. Dude, I don't mean to be a dick, but can you tell that story from the beginning? Okay, so I was... Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, dude, <laughs> I, well, I mean, that... I mean, you're definitely coming back for a part two. Uh, there's, there's so many parts to this because during the heroin years, I would hang out at Bukaki's and I started hanging out with porn stars. I got involved with uh, with some people down down south of the border. There's all kinds of all kinds of weird. I have so many. Uh, there was a 10 year period where I was like, I was every day I would walk into situations. There was guns. There was like this guy. I, I'm gonna get my head blown off. You know? Can you come back next Saturday? Yeah, rock and roll, baby. Because, uh, I, I mean, really, we could go on for sure, but I don't know if anyone wants to hear about your stand-up after that story. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's like people are like, are you, you know, what's your stand-up about? My ideal situation would be to get a TV show where I could tell my stories and have my stories animated and created and written down and then be able to do the store whenever I wanted and, you know, go on tour once in a while and just kind of have, like, that would be that would be my ideal. That's what I'm aiming at. I mean, that's how you, uh, you know, Rob Schneider said, just make your own shit. 
Is that what he said? Yeah, it's, that's what he did. Uh, you know, his show got canceled on CBS. He, most people would have either just quit or just said, fuck the industry. He's lucky enough to have a, some money, and he, he made his own show, and it's going to be on Netflix in December. So, fuck, there, You know, what What I've noticed, Earl, is the best of them in this in this business just don't don't get shot down. Don't get, and this is something I've struggled with, but don't get taken out by a rejection. Like, oh, that joke's not funny. You, you go, okay, well, what is? Like you, it's the, and I'm getting over this. This has been my biggest, I don't think it's lack of talent. I think I do have talent. I think I do have interesting stories. My, my weakest point in my game has been my insecurity and my, my sensitiveness. So like when I get jabbed, I'll just, I'll go to my room and just sulk for two days. So it's like constantly putting yourself back out on the chopping block after have being failed. That is something that I think that's the weak part of my game, and it's being addressed right now. But it's uh, that's the b- the best people don't get bothered by hearing no or doing bad. Oh yeah, you just gotta be. Uh, it's a ruthless town. I, mean, I I went to a Nickelodeon audition this week, and I, I, afterwards I gave my heart out, and they just go, uh huh, okay. And I was like, well, what what the what is uh huh okay? You know, it's like so funny, man. Well, I mean, uh, here's the thing: uh, if you quit, no one will give a shit. No I'm not it, saying yeah. you, yeah, like yeah. Just, but me, I could quit tomorrow and people would be like, oh, oh Earl. one guy, he's funny. Yeah. Earl was a great guy, but, uh, you know, now it's one less guy I got to deal with. You tell me what stories you want, because it, it, it can go anyway. I have so many fucking weird stories. I mean, I grew up with just weird people. Like, it is just... Absolutely. Well, I would keep going right now, but I have uh, uh, an unnamed comedy store employee. Uh, <laughs> no, no, secret location. He's picking up his Halloween costume and uh, setting up shop. What are his initials? Uh, Jeff Scott. <laughs> oh, uh, I saw it. No, Jeff uh, is uh, legendary for his costumes and his Halloween costume. No one's beating this thing. It's like uh, looks like a fucking pterodactyl, uh, and so we he's coming over momentarily. But uh, got it, dude. You're the first person I've ever said come back next Saturday. I can't wait. Can you come back next Saturday? I'm on, I'm on next Saturday. Three uh, o'clock? Three o'clock at the Skakel compound. I'll take you to dinner after. Uh, but I know we've said it a few times before, but Facebook, you're just Stephen Randolph. Yeah, Stephen Randolph. And just add me on Facebook, private message me. Just add me. I like the attention, man. And, yeah. uh, if you go on my... If you go on my Facebook, you could probably find him easiest because I'm yep. assuming there's like 10,000 Stephen Randolph. Yeah, that's the best way to do it, through your Facebook. So uh, go on Earl Skakel on Facebook and just look up Stephen Randolph. And then International Bad Boys Podcast. It's every uh, Monday, 3 o'clock with uh, Sam Tripoli, Chelsea Skidmore. And uh, we have Steve-O on this next Monday. And where do people find it? Um, it's at All Things Comedy. And uh, you know, just I post it on my page all the time, SoundCloud, The Naughty Show. And iTunes as well, I'm assuming. I, iTunes, yeah, all that. And iTunes, then, SoundCloud, and uh, all things comedy. And then uh, Twitter and Instagram, you're at Stephen Randolph. Two. The actual number two. Don't yeah. spell it out. The numeral two. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, this was just part one. I mean, uh, usually I say, oh, I'll have someone back in a few months. Uh, you know, but we didn't even really get into comedy with Stephen. Uh but uh, the because I, I you know we'd make a good comedy team. Here I am, completely sober, uh, you know, ever. And you've like done enough drugs for the two. I of love us. the both of us. You know, like we did on the Tom Green show. I feel very comfortable and supported by you. And I, I just I, I feel really I feel really good doing comedy with you, man. I always have. Well, I never. Uh, you know, I always hesitate. Likewise, but I always hesitate in telling people I've never had a drink or drug because I think. Uh, Earl, so, that's kinky, dude. I think that's the most interesting thing in the world. Like, you never have. You've had the money to. You just never have. I think that's kinky. That says something weird. If there's, like, a girl who is your age that never fucked with drugs or alcohol, I'm like, dude, she's into some weird sexual shit. Let's get weird. But, I mean, some people uh, would take it as, oh, you think you're better than me because you've never had a drug. N- not at all. You know what those people are called? Yeah. Alcoholics. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. The only and, people that care, people go, when everybody first gets sober, they go, what are my friends going to think? Your friends are going to be supportive that you're not wrecking your life. You know what? The alcoholics who are still drinking and using, they're going to be very weirded out by it because now they're going to have to address their problems. So I fuck them, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we're all on the same planet. We all shit out of the same hole. Some of us fuck in that hole. Yeah. I don't. I'd have only done it once. Uh, Love it. If you're out there and you're a hot girl. You know what? And you're in anal. You you know how to get me. It's not my thing. Steven Randolph, uh, you'll be back in a week for uh, part two. There might even be a part three. Fuck. Um, and uh, guys, this is inappropriate. Earl episode, I think, 89. We're getting inching towards 100. 
uh, and uh, iTunes and SoundCloud. Uh, review us on iTunes. It helps. And uh, you guys have been pretty good lately at uh, my one request from you guys. Tweet at Gene Simmons. Let's get Gene Simmons on Inappropriate Earl because uh, I won't ask him one question about Ace and Peter. We're going to get into the Mark St. John era, the Vinnie Vincent era. We're going to get into Kiss in the 80s, Desmond Child. We're going to talk about the song Time Traveler. We're going to talk about Gene on Miami Vice. We're going to talk about Gene with Rutger Hauer and Wanted Dead or Alive. Let's get Gene Simmons into West Hollywood. But Stephen Randolph will be back for more next Saturday. This will be out two days after Halloween. So I hope you guys had a safe and happy Halloween. Inappropriate Earl. See ya! Been a praying.